In 2010, something happened that attracted the attention of all the media channels around the world because a group of 33 miners found themselves buried 2,000 uh, uh, feet underground. Uh, they, they, they were going into a normal day of work at that mine, and 700,000 cubic meters of rock collapsed and closed the passageway to that mine, trapping them in the belly of the earth. And what was worse was that two days later, there was another collapse that blocked the ventilation ducts, and their chance of being found and of survival decreased from 10% now to 1%. And for 69 days, those 33 men were in a cave deep underground, but because a team of people from all over the world, some of the best specialists in every field and every area, came together towards that mission. 69 days later, the 33 men were able to be extracted and rescued from that mine. Everyone to this day that looks back at what happened in 2010 sees this as a great miracle. And we agree that it was a miracle, but it's not a miracle that can even be compared to what happened 2,000 years ago when the Son of God walked out of his grave after being placed there three days earlier. 2,000 years ago on a Sunday morning such as this, Jesus Christ walked out of this grave. And because he walked out of this grave, history has changed. The outlook of life and eternity has changed forever. And many of us who are here in this room today have experienced that resurrection power that was unleashed into the world that day when Jesus walked out of that grave. What the resurrection of Jesus Christ teaches us is that we are no longer under. Can you say this? I am no longer under. Can you say that? I am no longer under. This is the title of the sermon today. We are no longer under. And that is why the Apostle Paul writes what he writes in Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 17. So I want to invite you to read this passage with me. If you don't have a Bible, that is okay. We have the text on the screens, and you can follow along this way. This is what the Apostle Paul writes to the church in Galatia. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under, underline the word under, under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. This is the word of the Lord. Like many from different countries and different states, with their skills and their expertise and their tools gathered in front of that mine with the mission to rescue those miners. Jesus came into the world with a specific mission. Jesus came into the world with a clear mission. And that's what I want to reflect with you today. Let's talk about what his mission was, what was his mission, and then secondly, the reason for his mission, the why for his mission. Let's talk about his mission and the why for his mission. The Apostle Paul writes about this in this passage that we have just read. First, what was his mission? In essence, in plain terms, Jesus had a mission which was to enter human history to rescue sinners. 
He entered human history with a mission of rescue, with a rescue mission. The first line that we read in verse 4 is significant. Sometimes we don't pay attention to certain uh, sentences in Scripture, but this is a significant sentence. But when the fullness of time had come, at the appropriate time, this has happened. What the Apostle Paul is saying is that the resurrection of Jesus Christ actually took place historically. And I think that this is something for us to think through just a moment here today. I think this does something to our faith. Even myself, I've been a Christian for a long time, and every time I revisit this truth, I am encouraged. And I hope you would be encouraged as well. Because there's a lot of people that are in church buildings today, both in Catholic and Protestant church buildings today, celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is what all Christians are doing today. All the sermons and all the churches will be about the resurrection. That is for sure. But many people who enter these buildings, they enter the buildings and they really don't believe that this has happened historically. That this has actually taken place historically. That a man was placed in a grave on a Friday and walked out of this same grave on a Sunday morning. Now, there are many, and maybe you are one of those that are here today, many that believe that the resurrection is an inspiring mythological story. And even if it wasn't true, it doesn't matter because it serves to encourage us and to inspire us to live better lives, to live new lives, to live lives filled with hope. Now, I want you to pay attention to this because the Apostle Paul is always reminding Christians in the first century that the resurrection actually happened. It was a historical event. In another letter that he writes to the church in Corinth, in 1 Corinthians 15, he says this. He says, if Jesus did not raise from the dead, if he did not raise bodily from the dead, then our faith is in vain and we are just wasting our time. If Jesus did not really walk out of that grave some 2,000 years ago, the apostle Paul is saying, I don't know what we're doing here as a church. I don't know why we gather on Sundays. The central doctrine of our faith is the resurrection of Jesus. If Jesus rose from the dead, then everything matters. But if he did not rise from the dead, then nothing really matters. There are two words for time in Greek. There's the word kairos, which is the moment that we're going through right now. And then there's the word chronos, where we get the word chronology from. In this verse, the word that appears translated as time in the Greek is the word chronos, which is a word that alludes to historical events and historical facts. The Apostle Paul is saying this has really happened. In the right time, God entered history. He died and he rose from the dead. This happened historically. And I think this is important for us to acknowledge right from the get-go because many of us have no trouble believing in other historical events that have happened and taken place and forget that the resurrection of Jesus Christ has followed the same methodology. It was verified and it was authenticated through the same method. For instance, how do you know that Julius Caesar in 49 BC crossed the Rubicon? How do you know that for sure that that happened? How do you know as a fact that George Washington crossed the Delaware in 1776? How do you know that? Because those stories were passed down orally and documents were written about these accounts and the same happened with the resurrection. And I want to revisit what that method involves and how it applies to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, the, the, the first thing that is evaluated when uh, looking into a historical event is the interval between the event itself and the first sources that reported on the details of the event. And what they would say is this, the shorter the interval between the event and the sources, the higher the legitimacy of that event. How do you know that your team won last night? Well, because 
there was a live game, very short, the interval, and there are reports in all sorts of sports newspapers that tell me today that my team won last night. Now think about this. Julius Caesar, I'm just comparing with another historical event. Julius Caesar, he died in 44 BC. You know when the first document appeared reporting the details of his death, the first source, 160 years later. 160 years later, you have a document entitled Lives by a historian by the name of Plutarch that reported on the death of Julius Caesar. Up to that point, everything was oral tradition. It was people telling people that that had happened in the Senate. Look at the interval. The death of Jesus Christ, the first document that we have was the writings of the Apostle Paul 20 years after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You had the first sources. And you know what's so interesting? Is that the Apostle Paul says, hey, these sources are available. In fact, there's actually a bunch of live witnesses of the resurrection that are still around. When the Apostle Paul writes this, when he writes 1 Corinthians and Galatians, people who had seen the risen Christ were still alive. And so he writes, for instance, in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 5, the following. He says, uh, Jesus, this is after the resurrection, he appeared to Peter, who was one of the key disciples, then to the 12. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. He's saying some of these people that met with the risen Christ, risen Christ after his resurrection. Which, by the way, Jesus uh, remained on earth for 40 days after the resurrection. They ate with him. They talked to him. They touched him. He says over 500 people. Some of them are still alive. They live in that street. They live in that house. You can go there and verify with them. The number of witnesses that attest to the resurrection of Jesus is astounding compared to other historical events. Uh, thirdly, uh, you must put a historical account, an event, under the scrutiny of the number of manuscripts or the amount of documents that you have in order to certify that historical event. In the case of the death of Julius Caesar, you have about nine surviving documents starting with lives, the one that Plutarch wrote, 160 years later, nine. The death and the resurrection of Jesus has only 23,000, okay, 800 and something documents that survived, that retell the story of what has happened and taken place. Let me show you the next slide. This is going to help you to get perspective on things. They said that if you stacked all the documents that talk about the life and the death of Julius Caesar, it would amount to about four feet tall. A stack four feet tall, the height of an elementary school kid. Next slide. And if you stacked all of the documents, all the manuscripts, about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it would amount to four Empire State buildings stacked one on top of the other. And many people have an easier time believing in the life and death of Julius Caesar than the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The last thing I think is very important which is the motivation by which these documents were written. Uh, there are a lot of people that have come and they've tried to discredit the resurrection of Jesus Christ by saying that the resurrection of Jesus Christ was an account that was forged. It was fabricated by Jesus' followers after his death. That they wanted to take advantage of the momentum of the movement. And they wanted now to shine the spotlight on them. They wanted to take Jesus' spot and keep things going for popularity's sake. 
That is actually an interesting idea, except for the fact that if the disciples of Jesus, who had fabricated the story, at the moment that they were confronted with the truth of the story, at the cost of their lives, they would have come to a point that they would have denied it. Now, there are a lot of people that will die for what they think it's true, but no one dies for what they know is false. And when you look at the lives of the disciples of Jesus, who gave their lives to take the message of the resurrection out into the world of their days, they all ended up dying horrible lives. Some of them were beheaded. Some of them were sawn in half. Some of them were pierced by swords, like the apostle Peter, who was crucified upside down. Many of others died that way. So they had no other motivation than just to tell the truth because they saw the resurrection of Jesus Christ not only as a hope for their lives, but a hope for the world as well. So it really happened. Jesus entered human history. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, continues the text, he sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law. He came with a rescue mission. I was reading about the accounts of how they finally were able to pull those men out of that mine. And maybe you've seen the movie or you've read the story and what they were able to do. Uh, and by the way, the, that, that, that rock uh, that they were digging into is extremely hard rock. I mean, uh, harder than most uh, other terrains. And, and so it was really hard for them to drill a hole after they found and located the men from the surface to where the men were. And at first, it was a, it was a, a 10-inch hole that they were able to drop food and supplies as they were surviving underneath the ground, 2,300 feet underneath the ground. Later on, they began to expand that opening to the point that they had created this special capsule that they were able to drop down and uh, through that capsule, they were able to rescue one by one, from the first one through the, to the 33rd. And even though that was an extraordinary method of extraction, of salvation, what Jesus has done, according to what Paul is writing here, was significantly harder and significantly more meaningful. Because Jesus says, I'm not going to send a capsule down, I'm going to go down myself. What the resurrection teaches us is the grave that Jesus entered was our grave. He entered our graves. You know why? Because we are born into this world spiritually dead. That's what the apostle Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. None of us are born into this life spiritually alive. We are born spiritually dead. We are born in graves. And Jesus entered our grave he was there with us. Why is it significantly more meaningful? Because he identifies with our condition. He came under the law, under the judgment of God like we deserve. He came under that condition. And it was only because Jesus came down to our plane, came into our graves, that we could be extracted alive from it. That's what the resurrection teaches us. And had Jesus not gone into our graves, none of us would have been able to be extracted alive. It was because he entered our graves. And when we believe this, you know what this does to us? This removes from us the fear of death. It instills hopes into our hearts. That's why one of my favorite poets, George Herbert, as he reflects on the resurrection, he has this powerful line. He says, death used to be an executioner, but the resurrection has turned it into a gardener. The only thing that death can do to us, here's, here's why you, you, you don't need to fear death. The only thing that death can do to us is only make us better. It's only to purge us of our sins and bring us closer to the Father who has created us, who has redeemed us. Death can't hurt us anymore. That's why the Apostle Paul now in 1 Corinthians, in the other letter that we're talking about here, he says, oh, death, he's mocking death. Death, where is your sting? You can sting me, but the poison is not going to come in anymore. 
Because I no longer fear death. Death is actually a benefit to the Christian. The Bible says that death is something that the Lord sees as precious for his loved ones. It's precious to him because there's more presence, there's more connection, there's more intimacy. When we are into the other life. So the resurrection is God entering history to rescue us. Now, what's the reason for that? Why did he do that? I think that it's important that we understand the reason. And verse 5, we stopped in the middle of verse 5, continues and reads this. So that we might. So that we might. He did this so that we might. Here's the reason. So that we might. So that we might what? So that we could have a way in and a way out. Jesus came to rescue us, to open a way in for us, to give us a way in and a way out. What do you mean, Pastor, by he came to give us a way in? Look, continue to read verse 5. So that we might, what? Receive adoption as sons. So Jesus does not go into our graves and pull us out into the surface and sends us on a street. We're not safe from the grave to the street. Like, hey, now you're free. Do whatever you want to do with your life. Jesus saves us not from the grave to the street, but from the grave to the table. He brings us into his household And he says, my father is now your father. My seat at the table is now yours. He purposes his rescue mission to give us something infinitely greater than just being rescued from sin and death. A restoration of intimacy with God. We get to sit at the table of the creator God of the universe. And the only reason why that is possible is because of what Paul said here. In verse 1, still, God sent forth his son. It's through the son. No one gets to the table of the father if the son doesn't usher them in. The only way you get to God's table is if Jesus, who has a seat at the table, pulls a chair out for you for you to sit. And he brings you into the room and he says, this table is also yours. God has only one unbegotten son And that's Jesus, unbegotten because he has always existed as God's son. They always have coexisted as father and son. That's what the Christian theology says. And therefore, all of us are creatures of God, but the only way we can become children of God, and he says sons here, because sons has to do with the full rights that we receive once we come to faith in Jesus, regardless if you are a slave or free, if you are a Gentile or a Jew or a man or a woman, If you come through the sun, you have the full rights of the sun, regardless of who you are. You have a seat at the table. The only way you can become a child of God is through adoption. That's why he uses the word adoption. Only if you're adopted in Jesus. If it's not through Jesus, there is no privilege of intimacy and connection with God, which Jesus secures on the cross. Now, here is the following and the significance of the resurrection. How do we know that what Jesus did on the cross worked? Because on the cross there was an exchange, right? Jesus takes our place so that we can take his. Jesus gives up his seat at the Father's table so that we can have a seat. On the cross, one of the things that Jesus says is, my Father, my Father, why have you forsaken me? He actually says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But he's looking at the Father and he's saying, what's going on? Why are you not near me anymore? And it's because Jesus is carrying the full weight of all of our sins on the cross. And because there's sin, there's no relationship with God. And it's because Jesus took our place on the cross that we can take a seat at his table. You see what I'm saying? That's what happened, that exchange. Now, how do we know that that exchange actually works or have worked out? On Friday, we, re- we remembered of what happened on the cross, that exchange that has taken place. How do we know it's solid? How can we be assured that it's true, and that my position before God has completely changed, that I, in fact, have been rescued from the penalty of sin and death, from under the law. How do I know for sure that I was pulled from under? The resurrection assures us of that. The resurrection is the receipt that the cross has worked. I have to go to Costco every once in a while to 
buy supplies for my family and food. I have a big family. And sometimes I'm leaving Costco with two carts, one in each hand. And, you know, I get to the door and the guy asks me, where's the receipt? I was like, bro, I'm not stealing this, okay? There's no way I could have done this. But he wants to see the receipt because there's fraud. And so I have to let go of my grips, reach into my pocket, and then I say, bother me no more. Let me out, please. He's like, okay, I see it. And then I'm finally out. This is what the resurrection does for us. It's the receipt that the cross has worked. Jesus' resurrection is the heavenly receipt that you have been declared righteous, that you're in fact a child of God, that you have a seat at his table, that you are loved, that you are valued, that you have a purpose and that you have a future and that he will never abandon you. Because there are moments in life where we question and we doubt that. And the resurrection serves as a receipt. No, 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 no. He has not abandoned me yet. I think that he may have abandoned me. I feel like he has abandoned me. I feel unloved by him. But when I look at the resurrection, I have the full receipt that it, the cross has worked. And I am forever his. Look at the next thing that the apostle Paul writes in, in verse 7. And this is the way out. I said that the resurrection gives us the way in to his family and, and, and also a way out. In verse 7, he writes, so, every time that the apostle Paul gets to so or therefore, this is the application of everything that he has said. And, and this is the last thing that we read is, so you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. What's interesting about this statement that the Apostle Paul makes as he writes this letter to the church in Galatia is he's, he's actually writing to people that had believed in the resurrection at one point in their life. They had put their life's trust and faith in Jesus. And yet, they were living as slaves. And the Apostle Paul writes this letter to say, hey, listen, that is not your new reality. Why are you resorting back to old ways? Why if you were completely set free, why is it that you have this receipt, which is the resurrection, that affirms who you are? Why, why do you have that and you keep ignoring it? And you now return in these ways of living under as a slave. There are many Christians that have been set free by what Jesus has done positionally, but they still live as slaves. It's possible that you are here today and you have received this benefit, and it's there, but you haven't appropriated yourselves of it because you're still living as a slave. When I read uh, the story of these miners in a deeper way, it took me to this article uh, that came out a couple years later, NPR reported on it, and it said that out of the 33 miners that were rescued, 30 Two of them had been diagnosed with PTSD. And even though they were raised, elevated, and brought back to the surface, they were still living inside the cave. They couldn't go back to work. They couldn't engage their family. And there's a case of one of the guys that he was in such a severe state of PTSD that he built a high wall around his house in a safe neighborhood. High wall because he felt unsafe. 32 of the 33 experienced PTSD. Like many Christians who are ex still experiencing PTSD from their previous life and their previous spiritual trauma, and have not been really truly set free. Not because Jesus didn't do what he needed to do to set them free. It's because they're still living as slaves. The only one that was not diagnosed by the psychologist with, with PTSD was a man by the name of Jose, Jose Enrique. And you can look him up. And he happened to be a pastor. He moved on. In fact, to this day, he shares of how God saved them from that experience. And what you don't know about one of the main reasons why they survived is because of this. Let me tell you something. We all go through grief in life, 
If you're not going through grief, you will go through grief in life. Grief never kills us. What kills us is hopelessness. Without hope, you cannot survive. Hopelessness is what really kills us. And he knew that as a Christian minister. And so every day, look it up, he held two prayer meetings, noon and another one at 6 p.m., where he reminded them of the hope in Jesus Christ. And while they were in the belly of the earth, 22 of them came to faith. And so when they were rescued, they didn't just come to the surface of this world. They came into the surface of the spiritual world. They were raised from the grave into heaven, in, in the death, into eternity, because of the experience that they had there. And you know what God wants to do to some of you? is to do exactly the same thing with you today. He wants to meet you. At whatever grave you find yourself in today, you may may be in a relational grave. You may be in an emotional grave. You may actually be in a physical grave. There's a sentence of death against you. You may be in a financial grave. You may be in a spiritual grave. You've never left that grave since you were born. And today the Son of God wants to meet you there in that grave. And wants to say to you, because I walked in and walked out, here's my hand. You can walk out with me. He wants you to walk out with him today. Today could be the day that you can finally walk out of this grave because there is no grave that can hold us down. Like Johnny Cash wrote and sang, ain't no grave is going to hold this body down because of what Jesus Christ has done. He is risen. Got a couple of responses. The old school Christians, the elders. He is risen. Let's pray. Jesus, we're grateful that you have risen from the dead. We take it as true historical fact today. This is the basis of our gathering. This is the basis of our worship. This is the basis of our party that's going to happen throughout this day. And while we acknowledge the historicity of what has happened, And we celebrate around it. It deeply troubles me to know, as a fact, I know that there are people here that are trapped underneath the surface. They're still under the sentence of the law, under judgment. Father, they're still heading towards an unhopeful future. I acknowledge that there are some here that have in fact lost hope, all hopes. And Father, I pray that your spirit, the same, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the grave that Sunday morning, we believe that's here dwelling among us. I pray that your spirit would penetrate the hearts that are filled with hopelessness and darkness right now and that you would extract them out. Father, bring them out from their graves and to the table today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me tell you one last thing before I leave. There's a picture that I want to show you. It's the last picture on the slide. When those men were extracted, when the last one came out, there were about 2,000 townspeople and news sources and media from all over the world. The press was all there. And when the last man came out, they popped out champagne bottles and they partied their deliverance and their rescue. A couple weeks from today, Pastor David already talked about this, we're going to hold an all-campus beach baptism in Key Biscayne. And my hope is that some of you who have encountered that hope of Jesus today will make that public profession of faith two weeks from today while all of us will be 
standing on the beach shore, popping out champagne bottles, because we literally do that at Crossbridge. If you've never been to, if you've never been to a all campus Baptist, come at least for the champagne. And, we, and we're going to party your deliverance, your redemption in Jesus Christ. Amen? I believe that. I believe that. And so if you have had an encounter with Jesus, if you want that hope today, and if you want to take that next step, please register for baptism. Let's stand and let's worship the risen Christ. And let's, let's close our time together with our hearts filled with hope and the resurrection of Jesus.